Tonight, we are honored that Mr. Hitchens is here to discuss his new book, Thomas Jefferson, Author of America. Mr. Hitchens will entertain questions on other topics as well. Ladies and gentlemen, Christopher Hitchens. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, comrades and friends, if I can go that far. <laughs> yes, good. Uh, for coming. Um, I should add that uh, to the very fine list of compliments that Dennis just regaled you with, that I was recently called by Mr. George Galloway, a member of British Member of Parliament, a principal lobbyist for the Iraqi Ba'ath Party, and defender of the, of the forces of jihad and profiteer from the oil for food scandal, that I was a drink-sodden ex-Trotskyist popinjay. <laughs> Some of which was unfair. Um, there is another saying from Roman Antiquity, now I think of it. I think it's from Virgil. It says, uh, Mutato nomine et de te fabulo narrator. Change only the name, and this story is about you. And I include this in my study of Mr. Jefferson because it seems to me that anyone interested in the, the American experiment, the American Revolution, and in the multiple contradictions that arise from it, both personal and political, has to be interested in him. And since I know that people come to stores of this exalted kind not just to listen but to speak, and I'm counting on it, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be brief, and you'll forgive me my condensation, but I'll say why I think this applies and how, um, under just a few headings, the Enlightenment, the revolution, uh, war, and nation building, and slavery. Um, uh, Philadelphia in the late 18th century was not perhaps exactly fifth century Athens, but it was an extraordinary magnet for intellectuals and scientists and rationalists and philosophers. Uh, all of them, in my opinion, definable as men of the Enlightenment, and the Enlightenment definable simply like this. Once people have worked out that God is not going to help you, uh, that you're, to that extent, on your own, there may be a God, but he doesn't care about you. You have to take your own responsibility. That's what the Enlightenment means. Where religion ends, civilization begins, approximately. Once you've worked that out, then a huge number of things can happen all at once. Um, I would instance just a few. Um, vaccination against cholera. Uh, Timothy Dwight, the great divine of Yale University, still celebrated by Christian Americans, uh, denounced vaccination against cholera because it was an interference with God's design, which, if you believe in God's design, I presume it is. Uh, but there were people, Thomas Jefferson among them, who thought, very good idea to bring Dr. Jenner's discoveries and spread them throughout the United States. In fact, Jefferson even helped to work out how to keep the vaccine cool as he realized it lost its potency when it traveled in hot climates. Uh, one might instance Sir Joseph Priestley, the discoverer of oxygen, whose laboratory in Birmingham in England was smashed and broken up and burned out by a, a Christian mob, a pro-monarchist church and king mob, as they called themselves. Looked, looked at the wreckage of his laboratory and thought, I'm going to Philadelphia. Uh, they can't shut me up there. Thomas Paine came the same way, wafted across the Atlantic, carrying a letter from guess who, Dr. Benjamin Franklin. In some way, this extraordinary synthesis was occurring, and Jefferson was a very important part of it, and it was a question of taking, as, as I say, scientific and moral and medical uh, responsibility. And it's perhaps no accident that it was in that atmosphere that the American Anti-Slavery Society was founded with Mr. Payne and Mr. Franklin as, and Dr. Rush as among its earliest uh, members. And one of the things that makes Jefferson hard to write about, especially in a short form, is that he takes part in this Enlightenment moment. Uh, here's one way of putting it, by the way, between parentheses. If you want to be either exalted or depressed, I don't know which it would be. In the American election of 1796, the electorate had its choice between two candidates. One was the president of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and the other was the founder of the American Academy of Arts and Letters. <laughs> the candidacy seems to have shriveled a bit since then. I think they were <laughs> Not only that, under the 1796 rules, you could vote for both of them because the runner-up would be your vice president, and that's what the electorate did. It was a limited electorate, I will admit, but still, it had a rather handsome choice. 
Um, as I reverting to what I was saying about Jefferson, not only taking part in this extraordinary moment of the Enlightenment, not only rewriting John Locke when he came to compose the Declaration of Independence and changing life, liberty, and property, Locke's trivium or uh, triad or trico of ideas into a formulation that I know you don't need me to tell you about. Um, not only after that, leading Virginia through a very perilous period of revolutionary war, uh, then becoming minister to France. When that moment begins, his ministership to France in 1787, he's almost continuously in power after, afterwards for 25 years. And that's before he founds the University of Virginia and before he takes a razor to the New Testament to produce the Jefferson Bible, cutting out all the idiot that is fantastic or wicked or mythical or stupid mm -hmm. or incredible, thus leaving himself with a very short edition, <laughs> which you can now get from the Unitarian Church, uh, more or less for free. Uh, it's an extraordinary thing to have to uh, try and comprehend in one life. You can write a short life of Abraham Lincoln, you can, or of George Washington, you can. You have to struggle to write a short one um, about Mr. Jefferson. My, my view is approximately this. Um, the other day in Berkeley, it was decided to rename the Jefferson Elementary School um, for reasons I, I'm sure you can guess, comrades. Uh, how, how could Berkeley lower itself to have a school named after a slaveholder and adulterer? And, uh, uh, to uh, Sequoia School, Sequoia Elementary. And I thought, I could, get, I could get angry about this. I could try and be funny about it, after all. Why not? The trees were there first. It's an arboreal republic. Um, or I could just say, who cares what they think? It doesn't matter because there wouldn't be a United States. Uh, there wouldn't be a United States extending as far as Bishop Berkeley had in fact imagined it one day would to the Pacific Coast, materialized by Thomas There wouldn't be any of this if it wasn't for Thomas Jefferson. Which is why I have to quick, quickly mention war and revolution and, uh, and it's, it's awful corollary. Um, Jefferson had what I would describe as an almost Leninist attitude to inter-imperialist contradictions. The United States was to the northeast coast of North America what Chile is to the southwestern coast of the southern cone, a long ribbon-like literal, you might say, state uh, or republic, a trap between the ocean and the mountains. The Andes doing duty for the Alleghenies in the ca case of uh, Chile. Um, Three great empires, the British, the French, and the Spanish, held most of the rest of the continent and the Caribbean. And the approaches to the Atlantic. And there was no reason at all to suppose that the American Revolution would survive uh, in anything like its present form and, unless someone could manage very, very coldly and rationally and cynically to manipulate the rivalries between Britain and France and Spain and to wait for the moment when the essential thing had to happen, that the United States would get control of the Mississippi Basin. And only then could it become a serious country with its own rights to trade, its own rights to self-defense. And the ways in which Jefferson managed to manipulate this are most extraordinary. All of his sympathies were with the French Revolution. His sympathy for that was practically Leninist as well. He wouldn't hear a word said against it. His view was that the, the French Revolution should be defended at all costs, at all hazards. It didn't matter how many lives it took. It didn't matter how much suffering. There was another republic in the world. It owed its ideas uh, and its principles to the American Revolution. And it, it was a matter of more than something more than kinship and solidarity uh, to defend it at all costs. This got him into tremendous political trouble. But when it looked as if the French might wish to continue to hold on to New Orleans, he sent his envoys to Paris and said, if you continue to do this, we will without hesitation make an alliance with the British Empire and the British fleet. Uh, we will turn on you because New Orleans and Mississippi matter more to us than anything else and further charge his envoys with a secret budget with which he didn't bother to trouble Congress um, to bargain uh, for the Louisiana Territory and in the end to get it all and as Henry Adams who puts it best phrases it to double the size of the United States in one day at 10 cents an acre and that that uh, announcement was made in the Gazette in Washington DC on the 4th of July nicely enough and later on that same afternoon Messrs. Lewis and Clark received their commissions to embark for Pittsburgh and for the West on the same day. Because Jefferson wasn't just improvising, he had a plan for a long time.
Uh, Lewis and Clark had been sent to Philadelphia. They'd been trained in cholera vaccination for Indians uh, by Benjamin Rush. They'd been instructed in map making, in astronomy, in Indian languages, in agriculture and botany of all kinds. They'd been given a thorough enlightenment training. It was, uh, in fact, the greatest enlightenment project ever conceived. And on the day of the Louisiana Purchase announcement, as he sent them out, Jefferson was able to tell them, when you treat with and deal with the Indian monarchs and leaders who you will meet, and I urge you to treat with them with great respect, you will be able to tell them they already live in the United States. They owe no further allegiance to any empire or any emperor or any European monarch. And at that point, it's become very clear that we will one day be sitting in La Jolla discussing this question. <laughs> I can't say on the head of revolution that everything is positive or as intelligent. For example, the other great uh, revolution inspired by American and French ideas in the hemisphere was the revolution in Haiti. Um, I'm sure that Dennis will sell you, or if you can't do that, will lend you a copy uh, of C.L.R. James's magnificent book, uh, Black Jacobins. I've had it. The greatest, I also uh, have his book on cricket. Excellent. He was the greatest, the greatest writer from Trinidad ever produced, greater than Mike Paul, in my opinion. By far the best writer on cricket, and the, the great historian of the first black revolution and first black slave republic in history, which, under the uh, slogans of Liberté, Egalité, Fraternité, destroyed a French fleet and a French army and ruined Napoleon's plans for the region. Jefferson dreaded this revolution because he thought it was a slave revolt that could spread to the Carolinas and to Georgia, but it was in fact that revolution that so broke Napoleon's will that he was willing to sell Louisiana. So everyone here owes a debt that they probably don't acknowledge, and I bet have not been taught in school uh, to the slave rebels of Haiti, without whom revolutionary ideas would not have spread to the point where the United States could have been born. This is what it is to study history. This is what it is to understand dialectics, it seems to me. Um, nation building, war, Revolution, yeah, I've at least touched on them. Uh, and the Enlightenment. Now, one can't now avoid the question of slavery. At every step of this extraordinary business, oh, and I, I should just mention one more thing. Jefferson is the first president to send the United States to war. He's been brooding for 20 years on the necessity to punish the Barbary states of North Africa, as they're vulgarly known. That's to say the, the member states of the Ottoman Empire on the uh, North uh, west coast of Africa, uh, now known as Algeria, Morocco, uh, uh, Tunisia, and Libya, who supplied themselves and kept themselves going by the forcible impressment of sailors, the kidnapping of slaves, and the, and the uh, capturing of ships and cargoes. The best modern historians now estimate that between about 1650 and, and 1812, upwards of one and a half million European and American slaves were taken by this system which justified itself uh, from the Quran, said we are entitled to enslave infidels and to take their property, um, and kept in the most appalling conditions, and of course uh, negated, prohibited the free trade in the Atlantic approaches, the Straits of Gibraltar and the Mediterranean. Uh, Jefferson had wanted for many, many years to put an end to this system, and as soon as he was president, again without consulting Congress, uh, sent the fleet and told them to bombard the Barbary uh, capital cities until they gave it up, which they did. He didn't tell Congress until the fleet was so far away that it was beyond recall. It wasn't exactly a regime change policy, but it was a regime behavior modification policy. <laughs> and meant that by the time of the War of 1812, there was a serious American Navy capable of taking on real enemies uh, in distant waters. And of, of course, as you probably all do know, it was the first time the US Marine Corps was ever sent overseas. And that's why the first line of the Marine Anthem is um, from the halls of Montezuma to the shores of Tripoli. And I mention it because that was at least one slave trade that Jefferson put down. We can thank him for that much. But at every other stage of the career, I've just been very, very briefly sketching uh, the, the, the original sin, the taint, uh, the stain of slavery is present at all times. It means that the Great Enlightenment document, the Declaration of Independence, which first says life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and first proposes the idea of the consent of the governed, which is why we can link Jefferson's name to the word democracy, uh, is maimed uh, even as it's being written because the paragraphs that Jefferson wrote saying that slavery should not be legal in the United States were struck out uh, by in committee because with, uh, without, uh, without the slave states of Carolina and the Georgias and the slave traders 
of Connecticut and New York, consensus could not be achieved. So at the very beginning of the United States, there's an original sin and the Enlightenment project is negated. When Jefferson purchases Louisiana, an idea that he may well have got from Thomas Paine, who had certainly been a long advocate of it, Thomas Paine and Joel Barlow and other friends of his go to him. They say, Mr. President, we can start again now. We've doubled the size of the country at 10 cents an acre at that. We can begin again without slavery. Don't import any slaves to Louisiana, Mr. President. Don't do it. Send instead some thrifty German settlers and, and farmers. They will, they'll make this, this desert bloom. But Jefferson is in such a hurry to get the sugar cane cut, sugar cane cut, that and the sugar cane economy back on its feet to compete with other Caribbean powers. He says, no, we have to have slaves right away. And so slaves begin to be unloaded at New Orleans. Uh, and there is no new beginning. And everything is ruined. Just as those who believe that all labor-saving new modern devices were part of the Enlightenment fail to notice that Mr. Eli Whitney's cotton gin was going to prolong the cotton economy and make it more profitable and more labor intensive and more durable and more extended. So it isn't just that Jefferson fails to abolish slavery, it's that he extends it, deepens it, prolongs it. And because of the new states that are carved and cloned from the Louisiana Territory, gifts to the next generation approximately 50-50 slave and free states, which means that there's going to be a terrible war. And as Mr. Lincoln later was to say, uh, and, and the war came. Um, it's a uh, stain also, not just on his nation building, not just on his enlightenment project, not, not just a comment on his war policy, uh, not just a comment on his, his brilliant handling of foreign policy, but it's also a stain as Everybody now knows on his own private life, people may differ as to whether it was nastier of him to screw Sally Hemings or to own her. Um, I think owning her was worse, myself, but the moralists would say that having sex with her was worse than owning her. <laughs> Whichever it is, um, and she was his wife's half-sister at that, so you know what life was like down on the old Charlottesville plantation. <laughs> his wife and his mistress had the same father. Uh, that's why I re uh, return you to where I began. Uh, the descendants of that relationship now live among us happily and as free citizens. The one thing Jefferson never believed could happen. Actually, Sally Hemings and all her children passed as white in the census of 1830. Uh, and there's a, you can get a wonderful book now, pictures of all the descendants from, from uh, both sides of Jefferson's family. But we have not, I think, uh, by any means reached the point where these matters don't have to trouble us anymore. So distrustful though I am of the idea that the personal is political, normally whenever anyone says that, you know there's some hysterical bullshit about to follow. Um, <laughs> there, is, there is a sense in, in which it is true, and there is a sense in which, yes, this story, the story of Thomas Jefferson, is about you, is about all of us, and will stay with us for the rest of our days. And so with that, I'm very grateful for your coming, and I'm all yours. Thank you. I'm sure there are many questions. Uh, I, I have a question, Christopher. Uh, Sir? Yes, uh, yeah, uh, uh, do light up and use one of those mugs as a uh, trigger. Not the one with the whiskey in it. Or flip it, no, 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 or flip it on the floor. Uh, uh, in as much as we uh, live in a science-rich uh, environment here in La Jolla with the Neurosciences Institute, the Salk Institute, etc. Can you um, expound uh, to a further extent on the relationship between Dr. Benjamin Rush, Dr. Joseph Priestley, and, and others in the American Philosophical Society from Philadelphia and Thomas Jefferson. And Thomas Jefferson's mm -hmm. interest in science. Yes. Um, um, and inocul uh, 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 vaccination. I, I hope the question was audible to all, was it? Oh, yes. No, I, I, I could uh, ventriloquize uh, Comrade uh, Wills, perhaps. But he wanted to have me to say a little more about Jefferson as a scientist, especially given the um, scientific character and quality of the La Jolla, Greater La Jolla area. Yeah. And, the, and, the, and the scientific character of the Enlightenment in Philadelphia. Well, Jefferson could, uh, Jefferson designed his own plow, one that would turn the soil deeper and better and faster. Um, he spent a lot of his time trying to bring Virginia wines up to snuff with graftings and cuttings. Still hasn't quite worked. Uh, but it's a lot better than the Connecticut Chardonnay, I can tell you that. Uh, 
he, when, he, when there was a, a detail in a treaty between America and France about whaling and whale oil and how to do, deal with it, this will upset some people I know, but the facts must be faced, um, he decided to write a treatise on whaling all by himself just to determine what the economics of whaling were. Um, as I say, he was very keen on inoculation. He's, he's a great botanist, and his notes on the state of Virginia count as one of the very first studies of the American ecology and archaeology and, uh, so to speak, bedrock uh, ever written. And he had a great debate with the fantastic French phony, uh, the Comte de Buffon, who was considered then to be the greatest paleontologist of all time and who believed that the atmosphere of the United States could only produce pygmies and cretins um, <laughs> and slaves, um, and that even though the Native Americans were, were racially inferior and so forth. Well, uh, Jefferson, in his debate with de Buffon and in his notes on the state of Virginia, rallies tremendous scientific knowledge, but there's only so far he can go. Um, with, if, you, if you want to think of Jefferson in another tragic dimension, you can think like this. Um, Abraham Lincoln and Charles Darwin were born on exactly the same day. Pure coincidence, with no significance, but somehow interesting. I would say Darwin was a greater emancipator than Lincoln myself. But these people, living at the end of the 18th century, or living well into it, actually, I mean, Jefferson was alive when Darwin was born, had no idea of what was coming. They couldn't see as far as the next horizon. And so what they, a lot of what they write fills them with a sense of pathos. In his argument with de Buffon about the mountains of Virginia and the rock formations, neither of them could work it out. How do the shells get so high up on the mountaintop? How did they get there? They don't know. They don't know that deism is a fallacy. That it's the best they can do. Maybe there's a god who doesn't intervene, but it's the best we, it's as far as we can go. Um, maybe Jefferson speculated on this a lot. Maybe uh, people from Africa are of a different species, and that's why they're so biddable. That's why they take to slavery so easily. He hoped it wasn't true but I think he suspected that it was true. So he's living in the age of pseudoscience. He's living in the age of alchemy rather than chemistry. But as far as he could go with what scientific equipment he did have, whether it was studying balloons for transport, not for war, uh, or vaccination, he, he, he did push it, as far as I can see, as well as a man of the Enlightenment could do. And so we who stand on the shoulders of giants um, should be careful of being too, dare I say, judgmental. Um, about people who were doing the best uh, but still lived in an age of religious barbarism and ignorance and stupidity well, and superstition yeah. and slavery and madness and yeah. all that <laughs> that people want back now <laughs> which is now such nostalgia <laughs> I have a question from the Cur Colonel Carlson um. I know because you're unusually fair-minded and well-balanced and never really opinionated. Uh, I'm interested in why on earth you tackled uh, Mother Teresa as, a, as in the missionary position. Christopher, I'm sure you'll give a crazy to yeah. the audience. Uh, I was asked uh, why someone of my uh, natural uh, tenderness and pudeur <laughs> and fair-mindedness would... And by the way, one mustn't confuse fair-mindedness with objectivity. You, you know how people often do that in this culture. People say even, they think even handedness is objectivity or fairness is objectivity or uh, putting both sides. And there's not. Objectivity is the search for truth, even if it leads you to unwelcome conclusions. Uh, it's nothing at all to do with impartiality. But none of these things apply in the case of Mother Teresa because it's a, a simple matter of record that she was a fanatic and a fundamentalist and a fraud. Um, <laughs> I think probably the most, the most successful confidence trickster of the last century, um, and responsible for innumerable deaths, and for un untold suffering and misery, and proud of it. Um, do, should I just assert this, or would you require any proof? <laughs> I just learned well, you know how fair-minded some people could be. I just learned about John Roger and Charles Keating, for example. Oh, well. Thank you, John. There's one way, of, there are three ways, two, two ways of doing it. One is you say, well, if she was so wonderful, how come she went to Haiti at the invitation of the Duvalier family, took money from them, which didn't belong to them, had been stolen from the Haitian poor, said how wonderful the situation was for the poor in Haiti, how the poor loved the Duvaliers and the Duvaliers loved them back. How does she get to Haiti in the first place? She's supposed to be in Calcutta. 
You've got to get all the way to Haiti to praise a regime that is notorious for its ringing of the poor. Oh, she did it because out of solidarity with people who thought like her, and because she needed their money, which they'd stolen. As she stole hers from Charles Keating of the Lincoln Savings and Loan, who gave her a million and a half dollars and a private jet in return. Pretty good deal, actually, for an olive crucifix and a blessing when he was on trial. Uh, he needed a character witness. The court, the court then wrote to her and said, you've got a million and a half of the dollars we're looking for that belong to the poor of California. Do you feel like giving it back? She never replied. Uh, well, she'd written to the court in the first place. That's just the fraudulence. That's, I, that's just touching on the fraudulence. But by the way, if, if, any, if any of what I've just said is true, and it all is, how come you need me to tell you? How come that my profession hasn't enlightened you about this already? How come this woman stands underneath a Niagara of undiluted free publicity for all these years? Ask yourselves. But that's just the fraud. As for the fanaticism and the fundamentalism, look, she said that poverty was a gift from God. It should be accepted. It should be welcomed. She believed that uh, disease and poverty were necessary for the formation of a good character. And she opposed um, the only thing that uh, is known to cure, <laughs> excuse me, to cure poverty. There is only one known cure for poverty. It's very simple. It doesn't matter whether you go to Bangladesh or Basra or Bolivia. Um, if you can give women control over their rate of reproduction, uh, and come back to that village in 10 years' time, everything will be better, right away. It's the only thing that works. If you can throw in a handful of seeds and a bit of credit as well, and ge generally try and funnel it through the, the mothers and the wives, it will be enormously better right away. But it, nothing else works, and if you don't do it, people die all the time very horribly, and they have appalling diseases like polio that they can spread to other people. Well, Mother Teresa spent her entire life saying that that solution was impermissible. She waged her entire life making sure that didn't happen. So I wish there was a hell to which she could go, because she has a lot of death on her conscience, and a lot of misery, and stupidity, and ignorance, and dirt, and filth, and disease as well. Poison, a poisonous woman patronized by a poisonous pope, whose national security advisor she was, while, she could, while they could both breathe. I don't miss them, and nor should anybody else. Religion, religion is the enemy. How, is how long, how much is it going to take to convince us of this? Faith, faith is not a virtue, but if it was, it would be the most overrated of the virtues. We have a question right here in front, Christopher. You, you've written about democracy being something that's uh, highly susceptible to being exported. And, uh, you know, we're trying that in Iraq, and I'm not going to hammer on that. I'm just curious if if you have any observations how that should have been done in Iraq. The gentleman asks uh, whether I think, or if I think, or if it's the case that I think that democracy is for export. Would that be a fair pricing? Well, no, I mean, you've, you've stated that. Yes. You're right. uh, to which the answer is yes, I do. And then he asks, what about Iraq in that context? Well, how do you think it should have yeah. been done? Would, but have I summarized, for the, those who can't hear you. Okay. Would you accept that as a precy of your sure. question? Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know of any case where democracy has been implanted except by export, as a matter of fact. With the possible exception of the English Revolution of 1640 and the resulting civil war and the execution of the king and the establishment of parliament, it was reasonably homegrown, um, but had to be defended against interventions from outside, trying to prevent its spreading, which is the cor corollary case from the, from the papacy and um, the royalist powers of Europe, um, and which is a revolution that is germinal for Thomas Paine and for the American Revolution also, and the Scottish Enlightenment, and eventually the French Revolution. Um, were it not for the, for the French, the United States certainly would not have had a democracy. It was only the force of French arms that expelled the British Empire from North America. And that wasn't even a, a democratic country during the intervening. It was uh, King Louis who did that. Um, to the extent that, say, uh, India is a parliamentary democracy, it's not because of indigenous conditions. It has to be, simply has to be conceded. Most Indians would concede it. There had to be a collision between a, an admittedly very civilized and very advanced Indian uh, society and culture, which had never had it, even the idea of democracy or the free press or the printing press at all um, between, before this germinal process could begin. Western Europe, which likes to pride itself on being a cradle of democracy, would be 
not just itself for despotism, but would be the cause of despotism in others if it hadn't been bombed to rubble and started all over again by the force of British and American power. There would be no such thing as the United Nations if it weren't for a coalition of the willing that said you can't join the United Nations unless you've declared war on European fascism. And the same would apply uh, to, Ch to Japan um, and to many other places. So I mean, I'm afraid to say that democracy and export are to be mentioned always in the same breath because that's the breath that they're if they occur in. Uh, my opinion, if you want to hear it about Iraq, is uh, more or less congruent. Uh, coexistence with uh, totalitarian, expansionist, aggressive ideologies in state form isn't possible, which I'm glad is the case, because I don't think it's desirable. It's only a matter of who picks the time of the confrontation. I thought it was nice that for one, just for once, Saddam did not pick the time of the confrontation this time. And the knock-on effects of this in Lebanon, in Egypt, in Libya, uh, and elsewhere, and I hope soon in Iran, have already been very considerable. The, the implanting of the democratic idea by shock therapy. Um, we, we might wish it otherwise, but we would only be wishing. Thank you. Sure. There's a... Uh, I moved to ask you about Orwell's lesson for our times, but I also need to ask you about Hillary Clinton's possibilities in the next presidential cycle, and so I'm just wondering if you could construct it. Yes. <laughs> look, look first upon this picture and on this. Do you remember how Hamlet says? Mm -hmm. Look first upon this picture and on this Hyperion to a satyr. Uh, so we go from the sacred to the profane. Actually, no, <laughs> nothing that, nothing that, there's nothing sacred about George Orwell. George Orwell is simply a very good example of what intellectual honesty can do, intellectual integrity can do in the hands of one unaided person who never had a steady publisher, a steady job, a steady place to live, was always ill, was always poor was always censored, uh, but who managed to outlive and to diagnose correctly the three main problems of his time, which were Stalinism and fascism and, and imperialism. Um, and so that's an imperishable example. People sometimes say, well, what would he have said about Iraq, for example? And I say, I don't know, because he, he died when he was 46 and would have been 100 a couple of years ago. So there's no, there's no point in doing that. I'd love to, but I, I can't. I can tell you what he was said about Vietnam, because I know what he thought about European colonialism in Asia, and I've read it, and I've looked it up, and it's very clear to me that he would have been against the Vietnam War. The neoconservatives say he would have been with them. On Indochina, he wouldn't. I can be pretty confident on the as-if in, in that case. By the way, if I allow a parenthesis, I was at a seminar on biography at the um, Smithsonian the other day. I was invited to be a participant, and my, one of the one of the many distinguished people who were there, more senior than myself, Michael Corder, who's just mm -hmm. done a, an excellent book on President Grant, General Grant, in the same series, said, you, know, you mustn't ever write a biography in which you say, at this point, he or she must have thought, or must have felt, or must have. You're not entitled. And you'll lose your integrity as a biographer. And you can't know it. And you shouldn't do it. And I thought, how right that is. I've nodded at that so many times. But. Having just written about Thomas Jefferson, I don't completely agree with this anymore. Because I don't know anything about anything if I don't know what Thomas Jefferson thought and felt when he first saw Sally Hemings in Paris. I know exactly what he thought. I'm not a male or a mammal if I don't know what he thought. What he thought was, maybe for the first and only time in his life, man, there is a God. Uh, so, no rules are iron, but this one is fairly inflexible. Um, as for Mrs. Clinton, look, after all she's done for us and all she's suffered on our behalf, she feels she's owed the presidency. And, you know, who could possibly disagree? <laughs> Her life is meaningless if she doesn't get at least a shot. And we can, one can only sympathize. Unless you think, as I do, that uh, people should be distrusted who are running for therapeutic reasons. <laughs> because the presidency doesn't calm those demons, as her husband has already proved. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Amply. But uh, it, uh, look, the reason why we have to think about it, and the reason why your question is a good one, is this. 
What else can the Democrats do? And if that's the case, what the hell shape are we in? But it would be invidious if I pointed to questioners, I think, because... You point to whomever you wish, Chris. Uh, well, how do you know I haven't seeded the room with <laughs> members of my you immediate family? Of your family. That's what you yeah. said at the Virginia story, yes. No, but he's, he's not a member of your family, this chap right here. Sir? How has um, your perceived ide ideological shift affected your social life? <laughs> um... I was asked how my perceived ideological shift had affected my social life. Not much, because I have very few friends, only acquaintances. <laughs> I've got very little to lose. Um, I don't like m most people. I find most people boring. Um, it's easy to uh, turn one's back. I'm a cold fish. And when it comes to matters of life and death and of uh, principle, I find it very easy indeed to quarrel with people. So I don't ask what they think of me. I sometimes wonder what, um, if they uh, ask themselves what I think of them. But I, I'm at pains to tell them, <laughs> to dissolve any doubt. <laughs> so I sometimes wish I had a large family to fall back on. <laughs> but I was never much of a family values person. So it's really very nice of people like Dennis to invite me out every now and then, so I can, I can meet new people and socialize. I said the other day, in answer to a question not unlike this, I said, look, I don't want to be loved. And I suddenly thought, that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever said. I terribly want to be loved. I need to be loved. But I don't need to be liked. I don't need to be popular. You see what I mean? Go for the gold do, standard while you're at it. That's what do I do justice and let the skies fall. Ruat Kaidan. Yeah. Yes. What have you done to your women in this town? Is it going to be all chaps all the time? <laughs> what have you done to them? <laughs> ah, suddenly the chicks. <laughs> well, well, okay. I just I was too shy to look. <laughs> Western Europe. What, you, what is the future of Western Europe? Germany, France? <laughs> it's too broad a question, ma'am, if you don't mind my saying so. I was asked by the lady, what about the future of Western Europe? Could, could you not put a more oh, rem, arku, tetagisti? We're all breaking into ancient languages. This yes, year. yes, right. <laughs> put a bit more of a needle into that, perhaps. Not just for my sake. Because a boring future. question can get a boring answer. The future of socialism over there, it seems that... Um, they're not going to be able to afford, afford their government. They're not going to be able to sustain their way of living. And it seems that some of the people in our government are thinking that that is a good way to do things and would request more of the workers of the United States to pay more to the people that don't work quite so much. And yes. Um, if I can condense the question a bit, the, the lady asked whether, whether or not, in effect, the Europeans are paying themselves more than they earn and have got too used to a higher standard of living that doesn't quite uh, justify itself. Uh, well, the, the, the big difference, I think, between the, this will be very general, but between the American and the European model is this, that um, the United States continues to attract quite skilled labor from all over the world. We get the best, often, from places like Vietnam and Korea. Philippines and so forth, and, and indeed from countries to the immediate south of here. Um, with Europe, which has a continuous need for more labor, uh, they come up against skilled, very entrenched craft unions who don't really want new proletarians on the scene who might outbid them. So it's not a matter of the employers, it's much more a matter of the unions and what, and what they've become used to with long holidays, a lot of welfare and so forth. Which means, to answer your question about socialism, that the socialist movement is dead by definition because it's rich workers disliking poor ones. That's not exactly proletarian internationalism. The second thing is that most of the immigrants from Western Europe, to Western Europe, excuse me, who want to make up this deficit, uh, come at the moment from uh, Muslim countries. And everybody knows that there's a possible trap door underneath that apparent free gift of cheap labor. And I don't think I need to state it any more dramatically than that. The, the hope was, until recently, that uh, this deficit would be made up in another way from Poland, the new countries, the former communist countries of Eastern Europe. But it's a bit of a race between those two things. 
But I think social democratic welfareist Europe is pretty much finished, except for the British Labour Party's model. I, I'm a great admirer of Prime Minister Blair, um, who's managed not only to be an internationalist, in my view, and to fulfill Britain's internationalist responsibilities to countries where we have treaties with, like Sierra Leone, Iraq and Afghanistan, so we won't let you be taken over by gangsters, um, or run by gangsters anymore. But has also achieved something never been seen in Britain since the Second World War, as a full employment economy, and a very high rate of spending on welfare, and a huge surplus. While doing all this, it's really quite a remarkable thing. So I'm quite proud of my membership of the British Labour Party, which goes back now quite a long time. Bring it on. Um, in light of the recent bombings in London, how do you think Tony Blair is going to react to this? Do you think he's going to... They're asking them to remove their troops from Iraq. Do you think these, the bombings will strengthen his resolve, or do you think he's going to take some notice? <coughs> Excuse me. If you don't smoke, you should really take it up. Um, <laughs> before it's too late. Um, <laughs> The, um, the lady asked me, uh, in respect of the recent atrocities in London, whether this puts Mr. Blair in the position of uh, having to concede to his critics about Iraq. Would that be fair? Yeah. Well, I have to say two things about this. One, I'm completely fed up with reading about the heroism of my fellow Englishmen. Uh, I hope you're, you've had enough of it this week, too. Plucky London soldiers on, business as usual. The stoic Brits, the warm beer, the chips, the um, those breakfasts, you know. Drink your beer before it gets cold. Is this coffee or is it tea? All that. You know. I can't stand it. I, uh, I love the old country and I'm very proud of the um, phlegm uh, displayed by my friends and family, but I've had enough of it. Especially about the, how it's so much like the Blitz. I mean, yeah. just look here for a second. Throughout the whole of the 1930s, the British stolidly and phlegmatically and stoically lined up to vote for conservatives who were trying to give away Europe to Hitler. They wanted him to do it. When, when Chamberlain came back from Munich and was greeted by the Queen Mother, the Queen Mum on Buckingham Palace balcony, they all flooded into the streets to applaud. They couldn't get enough of it. They wanted a quiet life. They loved business as usual. Yeah, let's do that. And then when it all goes wrong, they get what they've earned for this. Then they, what else can they do but stand still under the bombing? Well, they can't move. It's an island, for Christ's sake. <laughs> when they could run away, they did. They sent their children to the country. The rich people moved into the well-fortified hotels. You read George Orwell on what it's like in, under the Blitz, or Stephen Spender, his time as a fire brigade officer. Fire brigade would wait for the flames to die out, and then they'd loot everything from the houses. <laughs> They'd say, well, actually, we don't take children's toys, Squire, but anything else pretty much fair game. <laughs> There's always something. It was a disgraceful performance. They blamed the Jews for hoarding goods and for pushing in front of queues. Was, uh, they panicked and trampled each other to get into the underground, which now people would trample themselves getting out of uh, to get away from it. It was all pretty ghastly. So enough of this romanticization of the English. They had enough of it. Um, but at least there was one thing you could say. Nobody said, well, why don't we give them what they want, the bombs? Why don't we just surrender? Why don't we look for the root causes of their grievance? There was at least none of that bullshit. And there won't be any of that bullshit anywhere where I can raise my voice either. Say it once, hope not to have to say it again. You do not deal yourself at hand in the conduct or formation of British foreign law defense policy by putting a bomb on a bus in Tavistock Square. You do not. Final. Do I have to say it twice? No. Will I listen to anyone who says that we should? I certainly will not. I certainly will not. And nor should anyone else. And the Prime Minister will not do so. And what people ought to realize is that there, there is indeed a connection between this and the Iraq War. The same people did this at uh, King's Cross and Edgware Road and Allgate uh, last week, who last Friday blew up 24 school children in Baghdad. Yes, of course there's a connection. We're fighting the same people. And they will rue the day. We will, we will outlive and outkill and outfight them. They say they prefer death to life. Maybe they do. If they want to be martyrs, we're here to help. But our love, really here to help, but our love for London will outlive their hatred and their love for death, believe me. Here, no here. question about that. Here, here. being with a 
this religiosity on the whole. And my hope is that when Bush passes, I think a lot of this is going to pass. And I think we're going to go back to being the middle of the road country. We've always sort of been, more or less. We swing to the left, we swing to the right, and from, thankfully, to this point, we come back to a middle ground. And I think we're just at a far end of one of those. What do you think? Um, it's been proposed by the lady that if once Bush is no longer president, the problem of religiosity will uh, shrink back to its pr proper proportion. Um, well, I don't think that's true. Um, I don't think that uh, religious fanaticism is a problem only under Republican administrations. I know there are many people who do think this. And I know that the Democratic National Committee can always count on shaking the trees and getting an extra few million from Jewish voters by scaring them with the specter of Pat Robertson. And I've become bored by this over the last 25 years. <laughs> Pat Robertson either is or is not a problem. He's not a problem only when George Bush is president, excuse me. Um, but I, but I'm, I really am a secularist. I really do believe in the establishment clause of the First Amendment. And I really am an atheist. I really think all religion is poison. I don't think, James Madison quite rightly said, why, there shouldn't be prayers at the opening of Congress. There's no, there shouldn't be chaplains in Congress. There shouldn't be chaplains in the armed forces. We're not going to pay for them to have chaplains in the armed forces. Why should we? Look what happened when we paid for Qurans at Guantanamo. You paid to give Qurans to Muslim religious nutcases. Are you glad you did this? No. What if they hadn't had any? They're supposed to know it by heart, for God's sake. No. It says that there may not be any establishment of religion by the government. That's what it says. And it's said in such a form that there's no wiggle room. Uh, they should, shouldn't say, God, we trust on the money. Uh, all of this. Uh, it, uh, Mr. Clinton shouldn't have gone around every day when he was up against it in the courts with Jesse Jackson and Billy Graham, two of the greatest frauds of the contemporary scene. Um, it was disgusting that at the service of the National Cathedral in Washington, my hometown, where we were burying our dead and the dead of New York, Billy Graham is invited to give the invocation as he would have been by any president since sure. Truman, and said, those we have lost are now in paradise and are happy and would not come back to us even if they could. <clears throat> Bin Ladenism, in the literal form. He knows how to get to paradise. And he knows what it's like when you get there. Obscene and disgusting thing to say. And, and who, I mean, if, unless New York has changed a lot since I was there last, not everyone who's killed there randomly dies in a state of grace. <laughs> Did you know, till you read those obits in the New York Times, how many saints there were in the city? I don't believe a word of it. Now, one woman I know, the wife of a senator, uh, walked out at that point. Only one. Quietly, she's got up, so I'm not listening to any of this crap. Everyone else said, oh, how wonderful to have Billy Graham to invoke bin Ladenism over the deaths of our brothers and sisters. No, no, no. This is moral suicide. It's conceding them half their point. We will regret it bitterly. Well, this, is, this is the occasion for just one thing, one thing only, to say the United States defends secularism in its own territory and anywhere else that it's threatened and counts those people as its allies. Now, Mr. Bush, who you've just reprobated, may be a bloody fool when it comes to saying that Jesus is, I don't know, got him, I mean, this is what I don't understand. He gave up bourbon for Jesus. Okay, I try and always be able to see the other person's point of view. Famous for it, can't do that. But, um, and he, of course, he said Islam was a religion of peace, which is a ridiculous thing to say, but one knows why he said it, I'll give him points for saying it. He said it at the mosque in Washington, I was there. I know why I said it, it's still a fatuous remark. But um, he knows whether he understands it or not, that the only allies the United States has in Afghanistan and in Iraq and now in Lebanon and elsewhere increasingly are the secular forces. It counts as an irony of history. The success of Bush's foreign policy depends on the success of secularism in the, in the Muslim world. And, um, and that's why it's appalling to see so many liberals making excuses for bin Ladenism and jihadism as if it was some kind of fucking liberation theology, which it is not. It's the most reactionary ideology in the history of the human race. Mm -hmm. It means business, it means slavery, it means mass murder, it means bigotry, it means the abolition of culture. And there are people who say we have to understand its deep-seated nature, which we certainly do, but not by apologizing to or retreating from it. The president's got that bit right, good for him. To that extent, I'm on his side. Oh, Christopher.
On the point of secularism, could you uh, speak to some extent on your recent trip to Iran and about what you wrote in Vanity Fair? Um, yes, um, our host asked me to say what I found in Iran when I was there. I've now become uh, the only writer to have been in the last, uh, in the century, let's say, in the last four, four years, to um, Iran, Iraq, and North Korea, so you can ask me any axis of evil question that you like. <laughs> and I keep thinking, there must be some money in this somewhere. <laughs> but in Iran, uh, there's the most extraordinary state of dual power, really. Uh, the, the, the mulocracy, the, the Khomeini-founded uh, theocratic uh, dictatorship, uh, holds the country in trust. It, it believes it owns Iran and all the people in it. It, it, it operates on a theory of government that's called the vilayet ifaki, which is the trusteeship of the clergy. The clergy are everybody's parents. They own the country. They are the parents of everybody in it. Uh, they decide who can run for election and who can win. Uh, they decide what can be published and what cannot. Um, they have a simulacrum of an open society. Uh, but they, it's a bogus uh, system, and when it's challenged, it resorts to violence and uh, sadism. Um, and it still considers, of course, 50% of the Iranian population to be um, beneath contempt. That's to say the female half. It threw away so many people in its historical war with Saddam Hussein uh, by the human wave tactic, the obscene suicide, we love death tactic. This is what it really means in practice. It means you take children out of school and you put them in the front line and you shove them across the minefield towards Saddam Hussein's machine guns, which are not going to be sentimental about children, you know that, to clear the mines and to try and clear the barbed wire. That's what it means. They lost maybe a million and a half of their kids that way. At the end of which, uh, they had to admit defeat, to discover that God wasn't on their side, which I could have told them. But did they listen? No. Um, and to say, well, we'll pay every woman in Iran an extra several thousand rials because they have an oil price that allows the subsidy of a great number of things, um, if they'll have uh, three or more children. So they got a sudden, they're back up to population now. And it's what I call the baby boomerang. Because the children who were born at this time, and who are now, we think the best estimates are that about 50% of the Iranian population is under 25 all hate the mullahs, hate them, mm. and hate the ghastly rule that they, so the, 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 the regime that spawned them is being turned on by them. They all want to live in California. Yeah. <laughs> they all have satellite dishes. They all know what's going on. They all want to read, they want to travel, they want to be able to hold hands with someone who isn't an immediate relative, because mm. if it's not an immediate relative, you can be flogged right then and there. Or, 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 hang, or hanged on a crane. Or hanged on a crane, or if it's really serious, um, and, and if you're sentenced to death, as you may know, um, the, the Islamic juridical law says you cannot be sentenced to death if you're a virgin. So they rape them before they hang them. So they're not virgins when they hang. Okay. Believe me, all this goes on. Bear it in mind the next time someone tells you to know what their grievances are. That's what their grievance is. There are unveiled women around the place. East Timor has been freed from Indonesian control. That's their grievance. Just, yes, by all means, study what their grievances are. And have, bear in mind what they, if you wonder what they have in mind for you, see what they've got in mind for Iranians. Okay. So, this is going to be a big battle in Iran. Well, there's going to be a tremendous tussle there. And once again, I believe that the president has declared in advance that we're on the right side of it and should be praised for doing so. A question for this gentleman. I, I promised I wouldn't do it, but he's really had his hand up for an awfully long time. Um. Well, I've been curious, uh, all day I was thinking about asking you uh, what your thoughts were as a historian and a scholar about the uh, state of human intelligence. Do you think it's uh, getting better or worse? <laughs> <laughs> well, Given all your subjects tonight. I mean, I'm hoping for the artificial because the, <laughs> the real is pretty disappointing. Yeah. Yeah. Can you give a praise Just as I have a fetus in my own freezer waiting for the stem cell. <laughs> I'm holding out for stem cells. Um, no, anything, it's like people saying, uh, the Catholics say we're against artificial contraception. Yeah, the one that works. <laughs> artificial intelligence might be that good. I, I'm only, I only say it's possible. Uh, we're, we've done, we are a very poor species as it happens now. I mean, we, anyone who examines themselves with any honesty has to know that the theory of evolution is correct. Not 
every theory, there are several theories. It's, it's not true to say evolution is only a theory. There are many competing theories of evolution. We know that it occurred, though. We just don't know exactly how and why, in each case. But, um, our prefrontal lobes are too small, much too small. That's the problem with the birth canal. I'm very sorry to say for those who like their birth canals tight. <laughs> um, for which I think there'll always be a demand. Yeah. Were, that not, were there to be looser ones, the skull could have a chance to improve. Prefrontal lobe is too fucking small. Okay. The adrenaline gland, by contrast, is much too big. We don't need that much adrenaline anymore. We don't need the fight or flight. We, we were, we're equipped for far more adrenaline than we need. The oppositional thumb is a bit of a sort of hand job. Um, it's all very disappointing. Um, the urinary tract don't start. You know, all of that. So we're very imperfectly evolved mammals, but we have only all we've got is the poor candle of reason and irony. But uh, but until we stop being afraid of death or the dark, um, we will, I think, continue to be very primitive. And the moments of enlightenment will be very few and very vulnerable. And so we should cherish the ones that we do have and not allow them to be trampled upon by barbarians and philistines and creeps and pukes <laughs> and kindred cattle. It's important. Who's next? I have a question. Back there. Um, a question. Get, getting back to the Jefferson book, I've read uh, some articles by a few historians, that, and they speculate <coughs> that uh, Jefferson was an atheist. Do you uh, <coughs> concur or disagree, or what, what are your thoughts on that? The general wants to know if I think Jefferson was an atheist. Um, my answer is provisionally yes. I mean, I've already given you the warning you know, how biographers mustn't do this. He never said he was. Um, he would attend public services, it's true to say. But he was a politician at the time. There was no way of not doing that. He defended Thomas Paine, who was under great attack for being an atheist. But actually, Paine wasn't an atheist either, um, or didn't say he was. Again, it was going a little further than anyone dared, or in pre-Darwinian times than anyone quite knew. Um, when he's dying, which I think is the test, as the Christians of the time thought it was a test. Um, we certainly know he wasn't a Christian, because he said that he faced his extinction with neither hope nor fear. Now, if you have neither hope nor fear, you're undoubtedly not a Christian. No man of the cloth was allowed anywhere near the bedside. And the headstone, the obelisk, which you may have seen at Charlottesville and elsewhere, re reproduced, uh, very specifically says only that he wanted to be remembered as author of the Virginia Statute on Religious Freedom, um, of the Declaration of Independence, and of, and of um, and founder of the University of Virginia. Uh, I didn't think anything else is worth mentioning. But I would say that's, not, that's the gravestone of an unbeliever. Uh, there is also a letter, which I think I quote, to a, a, a nephew of his on a reading program on how to educate yourself. And he says, you must study all the religious texts. And if you find that you think there is no God, be, be, be willing to accept this and, and let it make you happy. If you find that there is, I wish the same for you. Which means that he thought it himself. Must have, in order to be able to write that. He must have come at some point that allowed himself to think the heavens are empty. Well, this is empirical on my part, but it's very, very rare for people who've decided that it's untrue to go back. Extremely rare for atheists to reconvert or to convert or to become believers re again. Once you've gone there, you can't, there's really no going back over that bridge. So uh, that he was not a Christian is beyond doubt. Um, that he was absolutely against any state sponsorship of any religion of any kind is certain. And that he died without any hope of um, outliving his uh, body, I think, is reasonably sure, yeah. I have a question from the Edmund Burke scholar in the back. Hey guys, <laughs> question then. Um, why the Jefferson Bible? Well, the, I'm asked in that case, why the Jefferson Bible? Well, mm -hmm. oddly enough, it's proposed to him by John Adams, who says, why don't you tackle this question of the New Testament? And so Jefferson takes the view that, as does Thomas Paine, that Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, assuming he ever existed, was at least an exemplary human being. Who, whose precepts were 
as far as they can be understood, um, admirable ones. You can't say I don't think anything is inconsistent with that. Well, <coughs> you can be an atheist and believe that. In fact, I know a number of Muslim atheists whose way out, initial way out from the uh, poison of Islam was to notice what a horrible figure Muhammad is, even as adumbrated in the Quran and in the teachings. <laughs> Constantly interested in getting married to younger and younger girls, the la latest one being nine. Always laying down the law on how much spoil and plunder you could take. Um, very acquisitive, very greedy, very ambitious. Unattractive. Many Muslims think, well, why, should we, well, why is this guy the messenger of God? Some of them get out by means of Christianity. They say, well, this, this Nazarene fellow, who's also mentioned in the Quran, doesn't seem to have wanted anything for himself. Doesn't appear to have been greedy, or acquisitive, or a sex man. Now, all of this is totally meaningless to me, I should say. You know, I don't believe a word of any of these texts. But if you're looking for a handhold, and you're not quite ready to let go of faith, but you're, you're willing to let go of dogma, that's one way it can be done. And so the belief that Jesus of Nazareth was not necessarily all that bad a guy, it was consistent with, with believing that he wasn't the son of God, which of course he was not, because there is no God to have a son, and you know all that. I mean, virgins don't conceive and will give birth and, um, any more than statues weep or bleed. Um, and that was basically Jefferson's position. The Edmund Burke scholar has a follow-up. Go ahead, John. <laughs> Wait. But even that, by the way, sorry, even that he wouldn't allow to be published in his own lifetime. Which gives you an idea of what, he, how political he was. He was extremely political, very calculated. So this is what I think, but I'm sure I'm going to let everyone know it's what I think. So if he, he wouldn't even go that far in public. Imagine how far he went in private. John, what is your follow-up? Fast. Just a follow-up. Um, I mean, the question is about how he acted. I mean, you, you, you described it as he, re he removed the stuff that, you know, was offensive to reason. So... Mm. Is what remains sort of available to reason that reason can ascend to? Is he set up as, you know, sort of spirituality that doesn't require revelation? Is sort of a Kantian view that he's set up? The questioner thinks that he has me in a pincer. <laughs> And, and to some extent he does. I mean, he would if I was Thomas Jefferson, because Jefferson is indeed trying to have it both ways. He's saying, he's saying look, there is, there is ethics in this, there is morality, but it's also overlaid by superstition and myth, and, um, and so forth. one wants to kind of cleanse it from that, which is what Protestants have always tried to do uh, with Christianity. Uh, Jefferson, in fact, said that he believed Unitarianism would become the main faith in, or the main allegiance in the United States. He was wrong there. Um, but something like Unitarian belief, I think, is now very, very widespread, as is, as is Reform Judaism. A sort of non-religious, ethical spirituality is very, very widespread, far too much so for my <laughs> own taste. But uh, I, see, I don't think this circle can be squared, if that's your question to me, uh, uh, because much of the advice given in the Bible is flat out um, immoral or amoral, uh, just to take only the New Testament. Um, you aren't allowed to cast, uh, you aren't allowed to uh, take a judge, make formal judgment on anybody, condemn them unless, um, cast the first stone, in other words, unless you are yourself without sin. Well, that's pr ridiculous. On that basis, you couldn't indict Charles Manson. <laughs> You'd have to be a sinless, virtuous person yourself. It's obviously not true. It's obviously an immoral thing to say. So is the idea of taking no thought for the morrow, no saving, no thrift, don't worry about your family. Don't do any savings. Don't, don't think in any continent manner. There's no need for that. Now, that is obviously advice that, if taken, would be lethal. And as offered, is immoral. But it only makes sense if you think, as the, the, the speaker evidently did, that human life wasn't going to go on for very much longer. Um, that, the, that he and or his father would return very soon. So there wasn't any point in uh, looking after your children or planting next year's crops, or thinking about the future, or, or building, or, or anything of this So This is what's now called, in our mad Christian uh, culture, um, pre-millenarian dispensationalism. But there's no point in caring about the forests, or the oceans, or the atmosphere, because it isn't going to matter for very long. Well, I regard that as an obviously self-evidently evil doctrine, on, on all fours with jihadism. It's not, it, isn't, it doesn't deserve to be protected by the 
definition of it being a Christian thought. That only makes it worse. Oh, We're making a rod for our own backs. Anyway, Jefferson, as I said, born in the pre-Darwinian Dark Ages, uh, wasn't quite able to reach out and grasp that metal. There's another chap over here to your right with his hand up. Uh, I'm curious, what, what's your take on the state of the press in the United States? And also, do you have any thoughts, and I'm curious if you read any blogs and what your thoughts are on them, some call them the hope for citizen journalism and all that. I'm curious what your take is on that. The gentleman asked what I think of my uh, profession, uh, journalism, um, uh, at the present, and, Thank you, my good man. and um, whether I think that the blogging, uh, the rise of the blogger, um, is that of the citizen journalist. That was that a fair summary? Well, um, I became a journalist because I didn't want to have to rely on the press for information. <laughs> and I'm very sorry for people who do think that they, that the, that's what they're getting when they buy the New York Times in the morning. I only read it to make sure that what everyone else thinks is going on. Because <laughs> it's useful to know what people think is the, is the news. Um, and none of my sources are from the press. And I don't watch the television at all. Um, and yes, uh, from bloggers and their allies, I get most of what I think I need to know. And I'm very happy at the possibility, well, the evident likelihood now, of the decline of the networks and of the flagship uh, newspapers, which seem to me to be just engines of reassurance and consensus and bad writing, poor English. Uh, let them all die. I don't give a damn. I don't understand the United Nations. I don't understand what goes on with them, how much power they have or don't have, how necessary they are or not. What role do they play? The lady is flummoxed by the role and nature of the United Nations. Wants to know how they do this, what role do they play, what goes on there. Look, um, you're not alone. I mean, did you, who, who, who here has seen a Hotel Rwanda, for example? Good. But if you haven't seen it, you ought to go. It's actually, it's, it's, it gives you about 10% of what happened in Rwanda. But it's, it's a pretty solid 10%. The general, who's played by um, an odd choice, but it's Nick Nolte. Um, is, his name is General Romeo Dallaire. He's a Quebecois Canadian. He knew, he found out um, through sources among um, Hutu Democrats and others exactly the date the Hutu massacre of the Tutsi and the Hutu Democrats was going to occur, where the assembly points were, which churches and pulpits, and which radio stations and so would be used to call people to the assembly points and dish out the machetes and all of this. Not just machetes, by the way, that's a cliche about Africa. These were fragmentation weapons as well, on which Rwanda had spent most of its budget for genocide. He, said, he called up the UN, he said, we have a very small mission here, but we know what's about to happen. If we tell the government we, what we know, and if, meanwhile, we double the size of the UN force from, say, 250 to 500, we have a, f a chance of putting them off doing it. They, they, they might wonder if they were going to get away with it. Those faxes, which I've read, uh, landed on the desk of Kofi Annan, who threw them away. Um, Mr. Clinton instructed Ambassador Madeleine Albright, as she then was, to veto the resolution that was put into the UN by the Czech Republic, calling for a strengthened UN force and a warning to the, Ru the Rwandais genocide regime, vetoed by the United States. Then supported a French intervention, military intervention, which was on the side of the genocide forces. Uh, I mean, I could go on about this. Um, in uh, May of 2003, if Saddam Hussein had still been in power, um, guess what government would have been the chair of the United Nations Special Committee on Disarmament. <laughs> Iraq. So no one would have been appointed the chairman of that, as Libya had appointed the chair of the Human Rights Commission. <laughs> it's gone too far. It's gone, they let down Bosnia, they betrayed Bosnia. They betrayed Rwanda, they betrayed Somalia, they abandoned Iraq. Um, and they uh, the, uh, countries uh, with extreme self-interest in these situations are allowed to veto efforts at rescue. 
So the best UN people that I know believe two things, basically, if you want to think about reform at all. It's a very long subject, but first, that the permanent five members of the Security Council, that's the coalition of the willing, the, the countries that declared war on the Axis, which <coughs> could veto the membership of any country that didn't join, uh, didn't declare war, which is why Spain, for example, wasn't allowed to join the UN until the 50s, or Ireland, because they hadn't declared war on Hitler. And this permanent five is a farce now, because it used to be basically Taiwan, the US, Britain, Russia, and France. Um, it should be expanded at least by two members. I would, I would say India would be the most obvious one, a democratic, pluralist, secular, multi-ethnic country with a huge economy um, and a great civilization. And either I would say South Africa or Brazil. Don't know. But one, one of those, two, at least two of those three. And a veto should require two votes, not one. No one country should be able to veto all the other. That on its own would be a great thing. As it happens, though, um, in my opinion, the United States is the only one that represents the unspoken for. Um, but only the United States ever gets called unilateralist. I mean, the day I read the word unilateralist in the same sentence as the word Chirac in the New York Times will be an interesting day, but I don't expect ever to see this. And France bombs West Africa every day without, and invades Ivory Coast without even telling the UN, let alone asking explodes atmospheric and nuclear weapons in the Pacific, shoots and blows up Greenpeace vessels that protest about it, right. uncondemned, and sent a military expedition to Rwanda on the side of the genocida regime, unpunished, and is described as, but the French, the Europeans, take this more broad and general and mature view while Mr. Bush and his people are unilateralist. Don't believe this stuff. Don't be believing it. Take it from a European. There's no reason for American masochism on this point. This was to, uh, for once, it was decided, let's enforce the resolutions for a change. Let's put the offending government in the frame for a change. Let's give them a cutoff point for a change. Let's mean it for a change. And everyone grizzled and whined. They still do. This is masochism. There's no need for it. Christopher, maybe a couple more questions. As a gentleman to your right in the... You in the won this TV poll. <laughs> the other day for the greatest American president, uh, which was a profound shock to me, but not a surprise. Um, and so we, we realized how hazardous this enterprise of evaluating recent immediate history is. Um, I think if you asked me, I'd have to free associate somewhat. Uh, I'm a great critic of, um, of Winston Churchill and especially of the American cult of Winston Churchill's personality, and they have an essay in Love, Poetry, and War, available at fine bookstores <laughs> everywhere, <laughs> about why that is. But there's no question, when you've been through everything you can say against him and his terrible record in India and Ireland and yeah. in the First World War and everywhere else, that there's something, if the word historical figure means anything at all, whether it's Professor Elton or...